how to create a social media marketing strategy in seven steps. I'm Trish Roswick. I am the team lead here at Hootsuite. I've been with Hootsuite for two years, but prior to that, yes, I have worked in a variety of different size companies from small local real estate agents to enterprise companies such as Hootsuite. For those who are new to Hootsuite or haven't heard about Hootsuite before, I just wanted to give a quick little overview um, that we are a social media management service tool that empowers businesses and individuals and organizations to manage their social pages from one dashboard, schedule, post, track, and reply to, or reply to messages all in one place. I also wanted to flag to any nonprofit here today that Hootsuite does offer up to 75% off of our team and professional plans. We've actually partnered with TechSoup to help us scale our Hoot Giving program, but you can apply through with your TechSoup validation token to gain access to nonprofit discounts from organizations like Microsoft, Adobe, and Zoom. Obviously, using a platform like Hootsuite does help you bring your social strategy to life, as well as help grow your audience, get more donations, and be confident in what's working and what's not working. So if you are interested in learning more, I highly recommend visiting our Hoot Giving page and seeing just how Hootsuite can help your organization. I understand that we have about 30 minutes today, so if you have time to stay to the end, I hope you do because we do have a lot of free templates that I'm going to be handing out throughout the presentation that can help you get started. But yeah, let's talk about why you're here today. So seven steps to building a social media marketing strategy that you can share with your entire team. And you should be sharing this with your entire team. So in nonprofit organizations, you might not have one dedicated person who's working on your social accounts. So whoever has access to your social pages should understand why you're doing what you're doing on social. So why do you need a social strategy? Can't you just post willy-nilly and hope that it connects? No. A social strategy helps you outline your social media goals, tactics, and what you'll do to achieve them. It can also include what metrics you're tracking uh, to help measure your progress. It also highlights what networks you're posting on and what roles and responsibilities each player on your team can help cover. Let's get into it. We've got seven steps to go through. Some are a little bit more dense than others, but we're going to start off easy with choosing goals that align with organization goals. A winning strategy starts with clear goals. Without goals, you have no way to measure the effort you're putting into your socials. You've likely heard this before, but each of your social media marketing goals should be smart, specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time-bound. Some of the examples of a smart goal are what I have on screen here today. So increase brand awareness through post reach by X number of percentage, increase traffic to your website by X number of percentage, increase volunteer leads by X number of percentage, increase signups by X number of percentage. You do want to go even more specific with that. These are like a high level one. So you'll want to add, like I said, a time bound um, date of a, a completion on. And you'll also want to maybe get more specific as to what network these goals are going to be helping you on. So are we increasing volunteer leads on TikTok by this amount in three months? That's the kind of goal that you're working towards with your organization goals. Step two, identifying your target audience. So many businesses, organizations have this lovely idea that everyone is your audience, but unfortunately that's just not true. Even with nonprofit organizations, not everyone is going to connect with your message or initiative as much as you probably would like them to. So that's why you do need to identify your audience. Now, you know better than I do, because obviously I'm not working for a nonprofit, but when I think of your organizations, I think there's probably three audiences in particular that uh, you're targeting. Donors, volunteers, and partners. At times, these might be the same people, but often they aren't. Take time to create audience personas based on your organization. You should know things like your persona's age, location, interests, and even the gender of. So many social network analytics offer this kind of data, and I encourage everyone to look for it because designing personas will help you create content that speaks to your persona's interests or desires for being like for following your accounts. Uh, this will help you create stronger content that speaks to those different personas. Step number three is to run a social media audit. If you are already on social media, take stock of your efforts and ask yourself these questions. What's working? What's not? Who is engaging with you? What are your most valuable partnerships? Which networks does your target audience use? So 
Sorry about that. So running an audit can help you discover if some of your social efforts aren't delivering or which social efforts are delivering. So a good example of this would be, say, if your Facebook page is consistently underperforming, you might consider sunsetting it, especially if you've got a page like Instagram that is consistently performing well. Uh, this is also a great time to uncover any imposter accounts that might be using a similar name to your account to potentially scam potential uh, donors. These are just little things that you can do to make sure that your brand voice is not getting potentially disrupted by any other voices on social because it happens. There's a lot of people out there who want to take advantage of organizations by trying to replicate what they're doing. So this is a, just another way to make sure that your brand is safe at all times. We actually do have a template for running a social media audit that can help you do it quickly and effectively. I believe all of these links are going to be sent out. Oh, here it is. Oh, it's already in the chat. Okay, perfect. Next, step number four, setting yourself up for success. This starts with deciding which networks to actually be present on. And just want to, for the record, you don't need to be on every social network. If you do not have the time or the bandwidth or the team to support, please do not take on that extra work because each social network needs to have a specific strategy. And this does sound like more work. It is, but posting the same piece of content on each network every time without modifications doesn't work well anymore. We have data that backs up the fact that the average social user is on seven different social networks. So you can't really expect your audience to follow you on all those different networks if the content you're posting is exactly the same. This is something that needs to be, you need to divers, uh, diversify your content for each platform, which is why I severely stress you don't need to be everywhere if that's not necessarily what you have the time for. A good tip to help define your specific social media strategy is to write a short mission statement for each social network you're on. For example, we will use Instagram to educate our audience about our cause. We will use TikTok to recruit high school students who need to complete their 30 hours of community service, which is uh, a Canadian thing. So, I'm, so I apologize to my non-Canadian friends here today. That might not be relatable to you. And we'll use LinkedIn to share volunteer and employee start stories to share our, our organization's mission. So those are just a couple of examples to help define. The next level of this is making sure your social profiles are set up correctly. On the screen here, I have an example of Giving Tuesday, and this is their TikTok, Instagram, and LinkedIn page. Now, the one thing that I noticed instantly when I was looking at their page was that their social bio is different on every single network. There's keywords like generosity that pop up across the board, but even just looking at the content and how it differs from Instagram to TikTok, you can see that they have really taken this to heart and making sure that they diversify their content for each platform, as well as making sure their bio is set up specifically for the platforms they're on. So little things like this help you reach wider audiences. Excuse me. You'll see like we have their hashtag is featured on them as well. So again, there's that consistency. Uh, it's not on LinkedIn because it probably they don't see that hashtag audience there like you do on uh, TikTok and Instagram. So other things you can do is to just make sure you've filled out all the profile fields uh, add a donation button where you can to your social bio, include keywords people use to search for your organization, use consistent branding, so logos, images, et cetera, across all networks. Again, good example here. They have the same logo across their three pages. You can definitely see that blue coming through with their banner up on LinkedIn, as well as even in some of their images on uh, TikTok. And you can really see that blue coming strong on Instagram. And I would also say take advantage of TikTok for Good and YouTube's nonprofit partner programs to access additional features that could potentially increase your reach and visibility about your organization. Step number five, create an inspiration board. So in one of my previous jobs, I actually had a board that sat above my computer on my desk. And this included my company's colors, fonts, and logos, but it also included a variety of other brands and businesses that really inspired me. Now, these weren't people who were in my industry necessarily. A lot of them were people that I just took a lot of inspiration from, that I saw that they were doing cool things that I knew that my brand could uh, uh, copy. Um, and the truth is, you can actually pull a lot of inspiration from social accounts that aren't nonprofits, 
Um, I would suggest looking at brands that have similar audiences to you or just brands that you enjoy following. Another way to pull inspiration is ask your followers what they want from you. So run a poll from time to time on LinkedIn, Twitter, or Instagram, or just ask people to leave a comment about the kind of content that you've been posting lately. This is also a really great way in case you're new to social and unable to run a social audit for your own channels, it's really good to take stock of what is already out there. What are other people doing? Now, this is when you will look at your competitors and see what works for them and what doesn't and add that to your inspiration or your mood board. So pull from the success of brands that you like, what is their audience engaging with, maybe what their audience isn't engaging with and learn from that. And that's why I say you can pull a lot of inspiration from accounts that necessarily aren't like you, but share a lot of the same values or share very similar audiences. So step number six, we are flying through it today. When you're strapped for ideas, you do really want to lean on your social media content pillars and buckets. These content pillars and buckets will save you big time. Your content pillars are about three to four messages that connect with your social goals. I've included an example of what Hootsuite does. As you can see here, we have content series across the top, pillars across the bottom. At Hootsuite, we have three pillars that we use when we're creating content. Our massive one is our social media manager problems. That's our main audience. Those are the, the things that connect the best to our audience. Those are also the things that we want to make sure that we're doing consistently to encompass exactly what our goals are. So the next part here is you'll see community highlight and product updates. So some pillars that you might have would be fundraising, events, volunteering, or your organization story. The next level of this is identifying your social buckets. So these are what your social posts should be about. So we can pull from any of them here, but I'll do meme magic because that's a little bit more fun. So we love using memes to promote our products and to share relatable content. And we can apply this to a lot of things that we do, but most importantly, it connects best to the social marketers that we're targeting. So to extend this process, we have a much larger chart, uh, chart that goes into details about what networks we can post content on, what content types we should be posting. So video, carousels, PDFs, uh, link list posts, and sorry. And what is the lift for accomplishing this task? So is it an easy one or does it require more work? Does it require other teams to participate in? Which I think would be a really important aspect if you're looking to create a similar structure within your organizations. Because like I said earlier, if you don't have a dedicated person who's helping with social or you do uh, require outsourcing some of your content types, this is really helpful to so know how long is this roughly going to take. So when we get into my next step, you have something there to help you. Let's get into it. Final step, number seven, create a social content calendar. The final step in this process is to build a posting schedule. And this is incredibly helpful because once you schedule everything you want to do, all you need to do is create it and then post it. Now with Hootsuite, you actually just have to create it and schedule it and then we'll take care of the posting for you. But if that's not an option right now, no problem we have a template for that. So especially if you have multiple people helping to manage your social networks, having this calendar can help you split up jobs or efforts. If you have volunteers that will help you with your social pages, you can actually show them the calendar with the deadlines and they can take care of the rest. So like I said, we do have a template for this. It's very detailed with multiple pages. And because taking one takes time, it's nice to have a template ready to go. And you can also modify it in any way that you see fit, especially if certain things don't fit with what your organization's goals are. Go ahead and make a copy, change whatever you need to. This now puts into action your social pillars and buckets that we just talked about. So visually, you can actually mix your content and decide what works best for you. It also is really helpful when deciding like what places to be on, like what networks to be on, who's doing what, and how does this help with your goals? If you are starting from scratch, a good rule of thumb is the 80-20 rule. So 80% of your posts should inform, educate, or entertain your audience, and 20% should directly promote your organization. I know that there's probably a lot of people who are like, no, no, we just have to promote 100%. Unfortunately, that's not going to build 
your brand identity or your brand awareness. In marketing, you've probably heard this before, so I apologize if this is repetitive, but you have the marketing funnel. So you have the top, middle, and bottom of the funnel. When it comes to social, that 80% of that 80-20 rule is your awareness. So building that identity, building that brand loyalty, and basically building a reason for people to, to engage with your content. You theoretically can't expect every post to be bottom funnel, a hard sell. We want you to visit the website. We want you to donate here. We want you to take an action because that's not how people are going to get to know your organization as your organization. Uh, if everything you post is that hard sell, then what is the audience necessarily getting from you? What education are they getting? What if they're, maybe I want to donate to your service or another one. You need to build that brand loyalty up before you can really ask people to take that next step, to move down the funnel. So I really stress this. I, again, I know it's sometimes very difficult, but even at our own company, we've really taken a uh, more relaxed approach with even our bottom of marketing funnel because we found that the brand awareness and that brand loyalty that we can build from targeting more of a higher volume of our content as that awareness play has done substantially better. Now, I have a bonus template because I know you all are very busy. This can seem like a lot of work to put together and believe me, it is. So I'm here to share, I'm very happy to share that we actually do have a social media strategy template that's designed specifically for nonprofits. So this template details everything we went over today, plus a couple more things that will really help when detailing your social strategy, uh, your goals, your content pillars, and also help with the calendar you're putting together. So we do have those templates for you to take away. So that's a whole three templates you can take away with for future use. And I really do hope you, you find them valuable because I know for me, when I'm starting as a marketer, as well as someone who's coming into a marketing position, it's much easier to understand the inside thought process of the business you're working with if you have something that's written down like this already, just thinking about what onboarding was like for you, how can we make that a little bit easier, especially if you do have a number of people working on your social strategy? You can send them this, say, this is what we're trying to accomplish. There we go. Easy peasy. And now I'm close to wrapping up here. So I did want to finish up by saying that um, on November 14th, our Hootsuite Social Trends Report launches. This year, we are really excited to share that we are working together with Giving Tuesday. We've written a nonprofit-specific report. And then we're also hosting a nonprofit webinar on December 13th with guests from Witness Change, Plan International, and Giving Tuesday. I think we have, a, I think I sent Eli a link here too for you to sign up for the webinar if that's interesting to you. I have seen it and I think it is very fascinating. We go into really great details about how different nonprofits can use some of the big social trends from next year and apply that to their own strategies. If this was interesting to you and you wanted to learn more about how social impacts your organizations, I highly recommend signing up for it because they are, like I said, tailored to nonprofits specifically. Oh, that's awesome, Shannon. Very excited for you to watch it. Yes. So that's it for me. Um, I'm going to open the floor if there's any Q and A's, um, if you have any questions about social or honestly, any question, I will do my best to answer it. This is your chance to stump Trish your question right there into the chat. Or if you're brave, come off mic and like on mic and come join us. So I want to start off maybe with an icebreaker question. So Trish, should I, if I don't have a social media strategy yet, and I'm part of an organization, should I just, would you recommend I go and do the first draft of this myself so people have something to bounce off using this template? Or should I put together a bit of a committee? Like, what have you seen as being most successful? Yeah, that's an awesome question because it definitely depends. If you have been with the organization for a long time, then I would say you're probably very I say you should be comfortable enough to understand what your goals for the business are to be able to do it by yourself. However, if you're new to this doesn't exist, you haven't been with the organization for very long, then I would definitely seek out other people in the company that can probably answer those questions for you or just help you build this out to where it needs to be. Because a lot of this information is stuff that is at a larger scale. So if you don't 
know off the top of your head, then building a team is absolutely encouraged. So yeah, I would say it depends a little bit, but yeah, I hope that helps. Awesome. That's really helpful. I see we've got two other people in the queue and we've got Kim and Ben. Kim, do you want to jump on mic or do you want me to read this out for you? I answered part of Kim's question based on my Awesome. Let's, what, let's what tackle that questions. here. So Kim asks, are there resources or tips for building strategy around short-term projects, say, and this, this is a story you're going to hear a lot, a fundraising campaign? Like How do Tuesday. you recommend we come at that? Yeah, so that's a great question, especially because I, I can answer that very confidently. Even at Hootsuite, when we have short-term projects, we always create a strategy around them. So you may find that a good exercise is to create a build, stra uh, build strategy template for short-term projects and then long-term projects, but you will find that the initial build of them is very similar. So identifying what the goals of this are, what would you like the end result to be, and then the steps you're gonna take in order to get there. Um, for like a, a short-term fundraiser campaign, technically would maybe different than say like a volunteer campaign. So you're the best person to understand what needs to happen or what that needs to look like. But resources, I would need to go into the Hootsuite archives to see if we do have a resources. I think if you just give me two seconds, I actually think maybe I was sent one the other day. Mm -hmm. So let me just double check. Da, da, da. Oh, I think I was sent one. Fundraising tips for social. Let me just pull this up really quickly. What drives donations? Here we go. Okay. Let me know if that, oh, it looks like I'm sending this directly to Ricky. I apologize. Let me know if that works. I do know that for, we did a nonprofit webinar series earlier this year that did talk about this. So this might be a more helpful place to grab some tips from as long as that linked work. Ah, sorry. Looks like it awesome. didn't work. And Ricky just showed it out to everyone. It's perfect. <laughs> Great. I've got a question here from Becca, which is more on, on the benchmarking number side of things. So we, so the question is, when we are setting oh, goals... I'm showing yourself I, up. Oh, go for it. No, nope, maybe not. Okay, so Becca asks, when we are setting goals... How do we know what are realistic numbers to choose for that? So, for example, I want to grow my Facebook followers by X percentage. Is there like sector benchmarking? So I, at least I can have a sense of, am I making up a crazy number or a number that others like my organization have been able to achieve? Yeah, that is a fantastic question. I would say if, and again, this is assuming Becca, you've done this for maybe like even a year. If you have at least a year worth of data, this is something that you can pull from your own resources to help determine what next year looks like. Now, if you don't have that information, you, you haven't kept track or you're new to this. I, if you, I, I think we did create something. Let me just look up really quick. For, it was like engagement rates. 13 industries. Let me see if this is it. I think we have nonprofits in here. So this was like the engagement rate for across all networks. Yeah. Okay. So oh. I can't give you more than that. I think right now when it comes to followers, we do have tools in Hootsuite. So we do have a competitor benchmarking tool that does allow you to actually see what your competitors are doing. So you would probably get a better idea of where your baseline is, but it's hard to do without that kind of data. So I'd say start with this because this at least helps with engagement rates across all industries. So that could be engagement rate based off organic. This is organic. Yes, this is organic rates. So this is at least something to help, but unfortunately the, the best data that you have to set those benchmarks is your own data. Right. Um, so it could be something like you're going to take the next six months track like crazy. And then in six months, that's when you're going to start building those. But this is, I think, really helpful because sometimes it's good to be armed when you're going into conversation with your boss who maybe is overly optimistic. And you can say, here's what the, the world looks like on average. And of course, we're better. We're going to do much better than the average. Yes. But it gives you a place to, to set that conversation we're at. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it is hard. Like when I first got started working for a real estate agent, 
uh, he was very much look at all my competitors and that's, I can only look at their public information that like their likes, followers, that kind of information and start from there. But truly your best baseline is yourself. And something that I even told him was we need to start tracking for the next, like I said, three to six months before we can really set realistic goals on what we can possibly accomplish. Yeah. If you do have a boss, that's a little bit pushy. Unfortunately, that's a tough conversation, but Richard, do you have your hand up? I do. Awesome. Yeah, what I was going to ask, I just described and took advantage of through TechSoup and got the discounted rate. Mm -hmm. So I just did that a few days ago and they, I'm going to do the boot camp, but are there some other learning resources to learn the system that you would suggest so that I can become, I'm not the most tech savvy, but I want to become proficient. So is there something else you suggest? Yeah, take advantage of all the webinars we have. If you go to, let me see the webinar. Sorry, you guys are watching me do this real time. We have so many free webinars and other training things. Actually, you can see right here, Uplift, a workshop for social good. This was one of the other events that we ran just recently that, again, is targeted specifically for nonprofits. So we, like I said, we had a week long of events. That was the most recent this one, a week of social good. This is really helpful for any nonprofits because this actually was us talking to some really incredible nonprofit organizations about what they do specifically for different strategies. If you need more help with Hootsuite, a lot of this stuff, we'll talk about Hootsuite strategies. I know there are four boot camps. I know because I'm part of one, how to use Hootsuite like a pro. That one I highly recommend checking out because I do go into how to use Hootsuite in the some functionalities of it, but also our YouTube channel has a lot of really great resources just to help out as well. Thank that was you. One of my questions, Trish, or I was going to talk to you about it, or I didn't talk to you about it before when we met prior was how many people have actually seen that actual dashboard, right? Because that's challenging to use mm. if you've never used it. I had free versions of it 10 years ago, but yeah, right? It's true. So that's why I definitely say take if, if you sign up and you have access to those boot camps, definitely take advantage right. of them okay. because yeah, I we hear that feedback quite a lot and it's something sure that we're do. working on. Sure yeah, we're working on it constantly how to make our platform a little bit more uh user friendly off the hop. Yes, take if, if you do sign up, take advantage of those boot camps because they're designed for people who've never used the product before. And uh, yeah, you get me as a teacher to help walk through. It is the blessing and curse of being a, a powerful enterprise tool is it can do so much, but sometimes it takes a little bit of time to figure out that fancy new tool. I have another question around these links you've been sharing. Some of them have like little bits of fancy code on them there. What's that all about? Does that make it trackable? What's like, well, why would it bother doing that? What's going on there? Okay. Yeah. So that's the ones that have little things on the ends. Those are UTMs. So the UTMs help us track where people have come from when going to our website. So we add those to almost every, oh, actually I shouldn't say that. We add those to every single social post that we have that sends people back to our website because that helps us know how many people are clicking through to the website. It also helps our larger organization say, hey, social just brought in 2000 people last week from Instagram to the website. So more ways to show the value of social and help to prove to your organizations that, hey, social is incredibly helpful in driving people to where you need them to go is adding that UTM because that is actual data that we can use to say, we got someone from, from A to B. Now it's up to you to decide how they engage with the website. But from our perspective, UTMs are incredibly helpful. We use uh, Google Analytics, but you can also use Adobe Analytics and you can build them um, inside of Hootsuite, but that might be for certain tiers. So I'm not, I wouldn't take me for face value, but uh, building UTMs, there's lots of free tools online, especially like I said, with Google Analytics on how to build a UTM and then just add that to, to your link. So this is like a good practice, which is to say all these links should be tagged. Obviously, if you do it manually, mm -hmm. you may not do it every single time. The magic of a Hootsuite or something like that is yeah. it makes sure everything is tagged always, which means at the end of the day, that marketing team or the fundraising team can go and say, this is the traffic that we generated. This is our value 
in some ways to the organization, at least at the top of the funnel, bringing people to the website. Um, and then yes. from there, potentially you can even say, and the social people convert way better than everyone else on the fundraising page or something like that. You have this real power yeah. to have these numbers-based conversations. A hundred percent. It's also so helpful too, when you're testing different types of visuals, we call it AB testing when it comes to ads and it can be applied to basically everything that you're doing. So if, for example, you have a fundraiser coming up and you've got a few different types of assets and you're trying to see which convert the best, this is a best, this is a fantastic way of doing it because if the whole point of your conversion is get people to the website, okay, based on what asset performed the best, which one drove the most engagements, these are all things that can help you uh, create a more robust strategy, especially when it comes to the content creation side of things, because then you can look at your three options and say, what was the difference in copy? What was the difference in the visual? What time did we post it at? All of those things to help contribute to the success, which is how did we convert? How did we get people from point A to point B? And what uh, piece of content helped us get there? So all of that kind of stuff and all those tools that are available to you are, yeah, the yeah, they can definitely get long and ugly. That is for sure. But <laughs> those are other things that we have in Hootsuite. We have short link uh, link shorteners too, so that you don't have to look at those long, ugly links. But if you're new to UTMs, highly recommend checking those out. Nice. And I think, yeah, Becca is actually offering some really interesting insights about one, here's a basic UTM builder from Google. If you just want to experiment with this manually and yeah. two, you can also use this as Becca's talking about to say, if you put a QR code up there and put like a unique link behind that, you can even say like the QR code drove this much traffic versus other links to the website. So you can even put up a poster and know exactly yeah. how that poster performed for your campaign. A hundred percent. Yeah. We love a good QR code. I wouldn't, I would say don't use them too much because they can get a little repetitive, but yes, QR codes are awesome for helping exactly what you said, Eli. Isabel, it looks like you have a question too. Hello. There we go. Sorry, there I muted know. myself on my headset. So it's totally fine if you're unable to answer this. Mm -hmm. But I am part of a nonprofit that is acquired. And so I find myself somewhat restricted in what I could post. I guess I, I haven't had experience in marketing choirs before. And so we really have... Um, and other than that, I don't really know what else to post. I was wondering if you had any ideas on what other things I could throw in there. Yeah, for sure. A choir, just want to double, just so I know choir singing, you've got a group yeah. of people. I have a few ideas. I would say record your practice sessions if you can. I would say you could do meet the different people on your choir. So do a, I would, I can just picture her like having yeah. a ticket account where you're doing uh, introductions to people and asking them questions like what's your favorite warm-up song what is your favorite okay. uh, this I would say if you haven't spent some time on TikTok I see a lot of singing ones my favorite one is the guest who's actually singing one where you'd have five or six people on frame but yeah. only one person's actually singing those do crazy well because everyone's trying to guess who the person is. But here's the tip. Do not tell them in the first video. Make them go to part two mm -hmm. to find out who's actually the one singing. So things like that, those drive crazy engagements to get, again, build that brand that brand voice up a little bit more because it's showing your, your people yeah. and getting them involved. But yeah, I definitely see like TikTok being a really good channel for that considering there's a lot of really creative and you've got a talent mm -hmm. show it off. Right. So yeah. Anyway, I hope that okay. helps. Yeah. Th that's wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. No worries. Okay. Uh, this has been wonderful. And thank you all for joining today. Um, if you do have any more questions, you can always connect with me on, on social or on LinkedIn. It's 